I'd invite you this morning to take your Bible and turn to the book of Ephesians, chapter 1, the book of Ephesians, chapter 1. If it's your first Sunday here with us, again, want to welcome you. You have picked a good Sunday to start coming as we begin a new series on the book of Ephesians, an incredible letter. When we think of the great books of the New Testament, maybe the greatest book of the New Testament. Maybe we think first of the book of Romans because of its great uh, gospel argument from start to finish and its thoroughness of explaining uh, the way of salvation. And rightly, we do think of Romans as one of the great letters of the New Testament. But it's easy, I think, for us to sometimes overlook this little book of Ephesians right in the middle of Paul's prison epistles, this glorious letter filled with the riches that belong to us in Christ. Uh, Ephesians has been appreciated by Christians throughout history. It has often been called the crown jewel of Paul's theology. The great reformer John Calvin confessed that Ephesians was his favorite book of the Bible. Uh, When the reformer John Knox was on his deathbed, it is said that he requested Calvin's expositions of Ephesians to be read to him to comfort his soul. Charles Spurgeon said of this book, the epistle to the Ephesians is a complete body of divinity. Whosoever would see Christianity in a treatise, let him read, mark, learn, and inwardly digest the epistle to the Ephesians. Well-known commentator Matthew Henry As we have here an epitome of the whole Christian doctrine and almost all the chief heads of divinity. And John McKay, somewhat more succinctly, said this, Ephesians is doctrine set to music. Ephesians is doctrine set to music. And I especially like that one. Ephesians has a unique quality about it, a richness that is unsurpassed, a depth of theology that somehow lifts us up to the glories of heaven. The great 20th century preacher Martin Lloyd-Jones preached through the book of Ephesians over the course of 230 sermons. To put some perspective on that for you, that's 18 more sermons than it took me to get through Luke. And Ephesians is 18 chapters shorter than Luke, and the chapters are shorter than any of the chapters in Luke as well. For those of you who are starting to get worried, my goal is not to outdo Martin Lloyd-Jones and go slower than him. But it does speak to the incredible contents of this inspired letter given to us by the Holy Spirit through the Apostle Paul. And as I prayerfully thought about, you know, what should come after the Gospel of Luke? Uh, What is the book that we should go through next? I landed on Ephesians because of all of the various issues that Ephesians addresses. If if, if there is a book in the New Testament that addresses just a, a, a large list of questions that Christians commonly have, it is the book of Ephesians. Uh, I, I listed some of them here. God's sovereignty and salvation. Adoption, redemption, forgiveness, inheritance, and nearly every other aspect of our salvation is covered in Ephesians. We have an exposition of the grace of God. Uh, we have an explanation of what it means to be in Christ. We are told of the boundless riches that God has for us in Christ in this book. Now, we read about the power of God toward us in Christ. We learn about the death and resurrection of Christ. We see the supremacy of Christ over everything. We read about the total depravity of man. Uh, We learn about the power of the gospel and uniting Jew and Gentile at the cross. Ephesians talks to us about the marvel of prayer and the mystery of God's plan of salvation. Uh, Ephesians perhaps contains the greatest statements on the love of God in the Pauline epistles. And so we learn so much about God's love for us. We learn about the importance of church unity. We, we read about the mystery of the body of Christ, which is the church. We learn about the importance of sound doctrine and, and what it means to live a holy life. We Here in this book, we have this phrase, be filled with the Holy Spirit, and we learn about the importance and the meaning of what it is to live a life that is marked by the fullness of the Holy Spirit. 
Uh, we have uh, the most detailed explanation of marriage and family relationships that we find anywhere in the New Testament in the book of Ephesians. Uh, we read about that classic passage on the armor of God in the book of Ephesians. And, and this is the clearest exposition in the New Testament on the topic of spiritual warfare in the book of Ephesians. And, and you can see just from that list, how in the world did Paul get all of that in six chapters, right? Only the Holy Spirit could cover that much ground, that thoroughly in such a short space. And there's more even than those topics that we could discuss and we will discuss as we go through the book of Ephesians. You would be hard-pressed to find any issue that you're facing in your life today that is not somehow in some way addressed by Paul's letter to the Ephesians. Ephesians teaches us what it means to live as God's people in this world. Ephesians teaches us what it means to live as the church What is a healthy church? What should the church look like? How does the church grow? All of these things are are taught in the book of Ephesians. In fact, I think this is a a crucial time for Desert Hills. As the church continues to grow and and new people come and and leadership is being trained and and, and evangelism is being done, all the, the wonderful things we talked about last week that are happening among us, this is a crucial time when we need to understand what does it mean to be the church? How can we be a steward of the things that God is blessing us with and the things that that God is doing? And I believe as we study Ephesians and collectively as as a group of believers grasp with greater clarity and depth and joy what it means that we are saved by the riches of God's grace in Christ and we're saved to be the body of Christ on earth, this church will continue to grow and mature in ways that we can't even begin to conceive right now because we will understand more clearly what it means that we're a church and what it means to be a healthy church, what it means to be a growing church, what it means to be a biblical church built on sound doctrine and the truth of Jesus Christ, what it means to love one another, what it, what it means to be a church where the Holy Spirit is present week after week in our lives as we gather together for worship. This letter teaches us what spiritual growth looks like. How do you know if you're growing spiritually? Is that a feeling you have? Is more Bible verses you've memorized or more minutes you spend in prayer? How do you know Ephesians teaches us what spiritual growth is, how we can know if we're experiencing it? It teaches us how the church grows to maturity, and it teaches us how the church and the believer is to fight the battles we face in this evil age. We need these truths, brothers and sisters. And this is a marvelous time in the history of this church to bring these truths to bear with accuracy and clarity and authority so that this message will refine us and direct everything that we do, our understanding of who God is and who we are and what we have in light of Jesus Christ and his work for us. I'm excited to see what God is going to do in my life and your life and in the life of this church collectively as we study his word in the book of Ephesians verse by verse in the months and maybe years to come. We'll see. But this morning, we just want to introduce the letter. Just want to introduce it. I say just, not because that's a trivial thing to do, but just to indicate that's the scope of our study. So if you came this morning hoping that we were going to get all the way through verse 14 and uncover all the mysteries of adoption, predestination, election, and redemption, forgiveness, grace, and all those things, that's going to take some time to get through all of that. We have to uh, first get the foundation that Paul sets in verses 1 and 2. We need to understand some preliminary truths that anchor everything that comes in this letter. Look at uh, Ephesians 1, 1 and 2. Notice how Paul begins this glorious epistle to the Ephesians. He says, Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God to the saints who are at Ephesus and who are faithful in Christ Jesus, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. If we're going to boil down the truths of Christianity to their most basic level, there are really three truths we would need to know. Three things, three categories of truth we need to understand. To understand Christianity uh, biblically defined. We would need to know who God is. We would need to know who we are. And we would need to know what we have. Those are the three things that, that biblical Christianity is defined by. Who God is who we are, and what we have. Now, that isn't anything new or revolutionary. I didn't just 
dream that up in my study this week by revelation from God. This has been something that believers have, have talked about for centuries. You can read John Calvin's Institutes of the Christian Religion over 500, or about 500 years ago. He outlines it in a similar way. The whole book is outlined like this, who God is, in light of who God is, who we are, and in light of who God is and who we are, what God has done for us and given us in Christ. These are the basic truths of our faith. But these are the things that we most easily lose sight of in our world, in our walk with Christ as well. We forget who God is. And so we worry and we get anxious and we wonder what about the future and we wonder about how we're going to be cared for and all these things. We we forget who we are in Christ. And we lose track of, of what we have now that we are in Christ. And so Paul writes this letter to the Ephesians, and and really he is beginning the letter by reminding them of these three foundational truths of Christianity, which he will then unpack systematically throughout the rest of the letter. We need to understand these truths if we want to appropriate the great riches of our salvation. And Paul frames it like this. He explains some things about our salvation based on these truths. And he begins by showing that our salvation, first of all, is the result of a divine decision. A divine decision. We see that in verse 1. Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus, by the will of God. This speaks to who God is. Namely, the Savior. God is the Savior. God is the Redeemer. God is the one who saves us from our sins in Christ. We do not save ourselves. And we have to recognize that before a holy God, apart from Christ, we are condemned, and justly so. We are sinners, and we bring nothing to the table, nothing to the equation uh, that is worthy of salvation. We are guilty before God. We are helpless before God in ourselves. I love the way one of the hymn writers puts it. He says, guilty, vile, and helpless we. I mean, I don't know that there's a a better hymn hymn uh, description of sinners apart from Christ. Guilty, vile, helpless. That's who we are apart from Christ. In His amazing hymn, uh, Amazing Grace, John Newton describes himself with the word wretch. Saved a wretch like me. I'm a wretched person. Got that from the Apostle Paul in Romans 7, 24 and 25. Wretched man that I am. How could someone blind give himself sight? How could someone dead bring himself back to life? We cannot ransom ourselves. We cannot even assist in our salvation. We're not Jesus' helpers. We're not God's co-redeemers working with him for our salvation. We don't save ourselves. We need to begin and understand with this foundational truth, God is the Savior. God alone is the Savior, and he saves us through the work of Christ alone. Jesus came into this world to save wretches like us. He didn't come to help us save ourselves. He came to actually save us, to be the Savior, to do the saving, to be the Redeemer. And we see this in Paul's description of himself in verse 1. He says, Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus, by the will of God. Beginning with himself was common in Paul's day. That's how people began their letters. You know, we begin our letters, if we still write them, or our emails with the person we're writing to, uh, with their name, dear so-and-so, and then we end with regards or sincerely or some. Uh, blessing on the person that we're right with our name. Uh, in the ancient world, though, when you got a letter, you didn't want to wait till the end to find out who sent it. And so the people that wrote letters, they put their name right up front. Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ, Christ Jesus by the will of God. And so Paul does that. Now, not surprisingly, scholars debate whether Paul actually wrote this letter or whether someone wrote it in the name of Paul, somebody who understood Paul's theology wrote it and claimed to be Paul. Uh, The great thing about sound theology is how many pages of pointless discussion and commentaries it lets you skip while you're studying. Did Paul write this letter? Well, is the Bible inerrant, the truth of God in every word, breathed out by the Holy Spirit of God? Yes. So, Paul wrote the letter. See how easy that was? (laughs) Didn't take a PhD to figure that out. The important thing to note, though, is that Paul describes himself as an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God. Uh, Paul is an apostle. He is called to preach the gospel in the name of Jesus Christ to the Gentiles. 
and this was not his idea. Paul didn't sign up for this. This was not his decision. This was not his doing. This happened because of a divine decision that intervened in his life. This was God's will, God's choice, God's work, God's calling on Paul's life. And, and we've never really talked about Paul's conversion in a, in a message. Let's go back to Acts 9 for a minute and just remember how it happened that Paul became a believer and an apostle of Jesus Christ. Acts chapter 9. Of everybody in the church in the mid-30s, no one, and I mean no one, had Saul of Tarsus on their short list of future apostles and writer of New Testament letters. As Acts 9 begins, it says that Saul, who was uh, Paul, but then at that time called Saul, was still breathing threats and murder against the disciples of the Lord. Uh, he was hostile to the church. In fact, he had obtained letters from the authorities so that he could go to Damascus up north of Jerusalem and arrest Christians and haul them down to Jerusalem to be tried and some of them even executed. And so he gets these letters and he gets his caravan together and they begin making the trip north to Damascus. We'll pick up the narrative in Acts 9, chapter uh, 9, verse 3. As he, Saul, Paul, was traveling, it happened that he was approaching Damascus, and suddenly a light from heaven flashed around him, and he fell to the ground and heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And he said, who are you, Lord? And he said, I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. But get up and enter the city, and it will be told you what you must do. And look, Saul was not looking for Jesus. But Jesus, the one who seeks the lost sheep, Jesus, the one who looks for the lost coin, was looking for Saul. And Jesus confronts Saul on the road to Damascus. He literally knocks him to the ground and blinds his eyes with his glory. And Saul is nearly speechless, so Jesus does most of the talking, and it ends like this, it will be told you what you must do. Not, you know, what I'd like you to do. I'd give, I'm going to give you some options. I'd like you to consider a few things. Maybe you could pick multiple choice, you know, what ministry you want. It's going to be told you what you must do. There are no options. Saul, you're going into town. Someone's going to visit you with a divine mandate, a divine call on your life. There was a man in Damascus, a believer named Ananias. The Lord shows up to Ananias and tells him to go to Saul and to heal him of his blindness and tell him the message. Ananias isn't too thrilled about this. He knows who Saul is. In fact, he knows that Saul has authority to arrest any Christians he finds in Damascus and take them down to Jerusalem to be imprisoned and tried and potentially executed. And, and Ananias is uh, objecting to this. Uh, are you sure about that, Lord? Verse 15, the Lord encourages him. The Lord said to him, to Ananias, go, for he is a chosen instrument of mine to bear my name before the Gentiles and kings and the sons of Israel, for I will show him how much he must suffer for my name's sake. Notice what God calls Saul here, a chosen instrument of mine. Saul was minding his own business. He was a good, law-abiding Pharisee on his way to Damascus to prosecute the heretical Jesus cult when Jesus shows up, knocks him to the ground, and says, you're about to do a 180 because you are a chosen instrument of mine. Saul didn't make this choice. Jesus did. This was a divine decision. And notice what Jesus says to Ananias, for I will show him how much he might suffer. No. No how much he must suffer for my name's sake. This is not something that may happen or may not happen. Saul, you have been chosen. You've been picked out. Knocked you on the ground, made you go blind. And if you think that's bad, wait till you see the suffering you must endure for Jesus. People don't volunteer for that, right? 
It's not something you're going to, you're not going to get a lot of people, right, you know, who wants to sign up, unavoidable suffering, head's going to get chopped off, spend a lot of time in prison. Saul doesn't choose it. Jesus chooses it. And Jesus chooses him. This is something given to him by Christ. Saul, Paul understood this. This was not lost on him. In Acts 22, he talks about his conversion. In Acts 22, verse 12, he's explaining. He's on trial because he's suffering for Jesus. This is what Jesus was talking about. He's getting ready to go to prison. They're trying to kill him for the sake of the gospel. And in Acts 22, it, verse 12, it says, A certain Ananias, a man who was devout by the standard of the law, Paul is talking here, and well spoken by all the Jews who lived there, came to me. And standing near said to me, Brother Saul, receive your sight. And at that very time I looked up at him, and he said, The God of our fathers has appointed you to know his will and to see the righteous one and to hear an utterance from his mouth. For you will be a witness for him to all men of what you have seen and heard. There's not a lot of uh, wiggle room here. Right? God has appointed you. God has chosen you. God has made a decision, and you are the one that he has chosen. You're the one he's picked out, and you will be a witness. Not you might be, or would you be, are you willing to be, would you choose to be, but no, you will be, you shall be a witness. Now, this is the context for when Paul says in Ephesians 1, Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God. Paul is saying, look, I didn't pick this. I, didn't, I mean, if you're upset with me about me being an apostle, if you've got a beef with my letter, if you've got a problem with my authority, with the way I speak, with the way I communicate the gospel, or you don't think uh, I should be writing to you, maybe Peter or James or John should be writing to you, let me explain it. I didn't choose this. All right? I was chosen by the will of God. I'm a chosen instrument, not, not because of anything great about me, but because God wanted, he says in 1 Timothy, to demonstrate he'll save the worst sinner. That's why God picked me. Not because I'm so great, but I was so terrible. I was so terrible. God looked and couldn't find anybody worse. So I'll save the worst guy I can find. Make him a chosen instrument. An apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of of God. You know, I think this is what fueled Paul in his life and ministry. I mean, how do you do what Paul did if you don't understand that, that Jesus has chosen you for that and these are the things you must suffer because of the will of God? I mean, at some point you would think Paul would go, you know what? I'm out. I mean, I'm going to go be a hermit somewhere and just write Bible books off on my own and not deal with all of the suffering and all the difficulty. But he understands that's not an option for me. Jesus laid his hand on me. Jesus picked me. I'm in this by the will of God. This wasn't something I signed up for. I was on my way to persecute Christians, not become one. Paul recognized his life was not his own. But God had called him to himself. And now he was to live his life for that divine will because of that divine decision. And no matter how often Paul got discouraged or how bad the suffering was, there was always this truth of, of who God is that was in his mind. Even as he's sitting in a jail cell and writing the letter to the Ephesians. I mean, he's not often in some posh hotel somewhere in Rome, you know, enjoying the good life and, and eating grapes and and pasta, you know, he's, he's in prison writing this letter. And as he's there, he says, you know, I'm here by the will of God. I know who God is. God is the one who is sovereign. God is the one who sets the course of my life. And as he writes that, he understands it's better to be sitting in prison by the will of God as a Christian than it is to be persecuting the church in freedom as a Pharisee. It's okay. God has put his hand on me. And he understands the only reason he isn't still dead in sin is because of an amazing and marvelous and life-altering divine decision that was based on the will of God, not the will of Paul. Brothers and sisters, 
you're a follower of Christ this morning, understand this. Tapping out isn't an option. Giving up, that's not, that's not one of your choices. God's hand is on you. God has called you. God has chosen you. God has appointed you. God has picked you out. So why does God think I'm so great? He probably picked you out because you're so bad, okay? So don't get all, you know, arrogant about it. That's why he picked Paul. In fact, it says in 1 Corinthians, he doesn't pick many noble, doesn't pick many wise. He picks the nobodies, the nothings, the cast-offs, the losers. I hate to break it to you, but that's who we are in the eyes of the world. We're the, we're the nobodies. We're the losers. And God says, you know what? I'm going to do something amazing through the nobodies. I'm going to do something amazing through the losers. I'm going to pick them. And so we don't have the option of saying, okay, I'm, you know, I'm out, God. I'm done. That's enough suffering. That's enough difficult. That's enough trial. God says, no, you are mine by the will of God. You understand who God is. God's our Savior. God's our Redeemer. We also need to understand who we are in Christ. And we see that in the second point, that, that our redemption is based on a divine decision that results in a divine transformation. This divine decision results in a divine transformation. Notice verse 1 uh, the second half, he says, to the saints who are at Ephesus and who are faithful in Christ Jesus. Listen, Ephesians, you need to know who you are. God's the deliverer. God's the savior. Here's who you are. Went through our study on social justice and we saw that identity politics and intersectionality are on the rise. If you don't know what those are, you can go back to the first message and Listen to the explanation of those things. But people are often driven to define themselves by some kind of identity. Who am I? And they find a lot of different ways to define themselves. Maybe it's their work, their job, their race, their sexual desires and activities, their age, other aspects of their life or their character. All of these things uh, they, they look to for an identity. This is who I am. This has become a massive issue today. And for Christians, it's no different. But the temptation for us today is to go along with the way the culture views identity and to look for my identity in, in something about me that's inherent to me, maybe my skin color, maybe my ethnicity, maybe a political affiliation or some other secular identity marker. And perhaps today, more so than at any time in history, it is vital for Christians to remember who we are. What is our identity? And we see that in verse 1, we are transformed people in Christ. We are saints. And we are faithful. What does that mean? Well, first of all, he says we're saints. The word saint in the Bible has uh, some different meanings. If you have a Roman Catholic background, you might be surprised to learn that if you are a Christian, the Bible says you're a saint. Saints in Roman Catholicism are typically only those who have shown extreme devotion to God and have been canonized by the church. But in the New Testament, that's not the reality. In the New Testament, every believer is a saint. Every Christian is a saint. All believers are, are called saints by God. Sometimes people have the idea that a saint is, is someone who is a good person or a perfect person. You know, maybe you've heard somebody say, well, you know, I'm no saint. You know, or, or well, he's no saint, or she's no saint. Well, what they mean, you know, I'm not perfect, I have flaws. We have the misconception maybe that being a saint is to be perfect. Never to make any mistakes, never to sin, to be better than others. What does it mean to be a saint biblically? What does the Bible mean by saint? Well, the word saint has the basic meaning of being holy. It means to be holy. And, and holy in the Bible has different nuances to it. Sometimes it's referred to, it's used to refer to something that is set apart for divine use. We might think of maybe the vessels that were in the tabernacle or in the temple and how they were considered holy vessels. Uh, they were the opposite of the vessels that were common. The uh, vessels that were common you used for drinking every day, for barbecuing every day. Those were the utensils and the cups and the plates. Those were your everyday uh, dishes. But the holy vessels were only to be used in worship and only by certain people and only at certain times, very special occasions. You say, well, did they look different than the common 
you know, grill flipper that they used on Friday when they were barbecuing? No, probably not. Maybe they were made out of a different metal, but they didn't look any different. I mean, a, a tong is a tong, right? I mean, that's, it is what it is. What made them different? What made them different is they were set apart by God. That's what made them different. Not their external appearance, nothing outward about them. And the same thing is true of saints. We have been set apart for divine use. God has called us out of the world to be used to worship and glorify him. You can't tell a saint just by looking at someone's outward appearance. I mean, we look like everybody else. We don't have halos, you know, we're not glowing or, or you know, we don't have to dress weird to, to, you know, to show the world that we're saints. There's nothing uh, unusual about us externally or visibly about our physical appearance. What, it set, what sets us apart is that God uses us to glorify him through acts of worship. It is that, that we are to, to use our bodies as a living sacrifice. It is, it is that being set apart from God that makes us different, not how we dress or how we look or, or those types of things. God has declared that we are holy. He has set us apart. We might refer to this as positional sanctification. This isn't something that you experience. This is something that God determines and says is true about you because of Christ. You are separate from the world. But holiness also has the idea of being set apart in purity, being set apart in righteousness, being set apart in a moral sense. We might think about God himself, the ultimate standard of holiness, the thrice holy God. That obviously means that God is unique. No one is like him. He's utterly different and set apart from his creation. But God's holiness also has a moral dimension to it. In the book of Habakkuk, you can turn back there if you can find it. It's a little one there towards the back of your Bible. But in the book of Habakkuk, the Lord tells the prophet Habakkuk, that he's going to use Babylon to judge Judah. And Habakkuk is blown away by this and not in a good way. He he says, wait a second. I mean, I know we're bad and we deserve judgment, but they're worse. I mean, they deserve more judgment than we do. How is it right for God to use worse sinners to judge better sinners? God, you're making no sense. And he's got to try to sort this out. And so he goes to prayer in verse 12 of chapter 1. And he says, are you not from everlasting, O Lord, my God, my Holy One? God, you're holy, he says. And then in verse 13, this holiness has an application for how God is is supposed to act. He says in verse 13, your eyes are too pure to approve evil. And you cannot look on wickedness with favor. God's holiness means he's too pure to approve evil. He can't even look on wickedness with favor. The holiness of God is God's purity, his righteousness. That's why when we see Isaiah in the book of Isaiah, chapter 6, as he comes into the presence of, of Christ, seated on the throne, high and lifted up, and the glory of Christ filling the temple and the train of his robe, going all the way to the back of the temple, filling the whole building, showing his glory and his majesty and his wonder, that Isaiah looks at, at Christ seated on the throne and says, I am undone. Why? Because I'm a man of unclean lips, and I have seen someone who is holy, too pure to look on evil, and I'm standing in his presence. How can he look on me without destroying me? It's because of the purity of God in his holiness. So when Paul says that the Ephesians are saints, he not only means that God has positionally set them apart, taken them out of the world in the sense of of, of setting them apart as his own special people, but that they are people that have been transformed by God to live holy lives, to be pure, speaks to their obedience. We are transformed by the Spirit of God so that we are no longer darkness but light in the Lord, Ephesians 5, 8 says. Ephesians 2, 3, it says that we formerly lived in the lusts of our flesh. We don't live that way anymore because we're saints and set apart. 
Verse 1 of chapter 5, he tells the Ephesians they're to be imitators of God, walking in love. And chapter 6, verse 10, that we're to stand firm in the evil day and resist the forces of evil. We're to be holy. We're set apart for God's use, and our daily living reflects that reality if we are in Christ. We are seeking to honor the Lord. We're seeking to grow more and more like Christ in love and grace. We've been transformed from rebels into saints, from unholy to holy, from sinners into saints. Sometimes this is called our progressive sanctification because we grow in this holiness. We learn to express this holiness through our lives day by day. Uh, it, we don't start off as baby Christians uh, being as holy as we will be in our practice as we will be 10 years, 20 years, 30 years, or when the Lord calls us home. To be a saint then means to be holy positionally. You're set apart for God. You belong to him, and you're to express that belonging to God through your obedience. Notice also that he says we're faithful. To the saints who are at Ephesus and who are faithful. This word is variously translated as faithful or believers. It means both things, and in different contexts is used in both ways. It's difficult because both things are true. I mean, we are believers, and we are faithful in Christ if we are followers of Christ. But the meaning here seems to be more what the word faithful means in English if we break it down into its component parts. Faithful is the combination of two English words, faith and full. F-U-L-L, we just lose an L at the end. But it's the combination of faith and full. And the idea here is someone that is faithful is someone that is full of faith. They're filled with faith on the inside. Their heart is just overflowing with trust in God through Christ. The believer then is a saint who is filled with this kind of faith. And this is a little bit of a foreshadowing of where he'll go in chapter 5, verse 18, when he tells us to be filled with the Holy Spirit. Only people who are full of faith are full of the Holy Spirit, and people who are filled with the Holy Spirit are filled with faith. I love the, the picture this paints of the transformation we've experienced in our salvation. We were without faith, right? We had no faith. We were faithless. But now we are filled with faith because of the work of God. We've been transformed so that we are people who are full of trust in the word of God and the Lord Jesus Christ. This speaks to so much more than a mere academic agreement with a set of facts. That isn't faith, biblically speaking. That's just knowledge. You can know things and not have faith. You can't have faith without knowing the things that you need to believe, but you can have knowledge without faith. And, and here he's talking about people that don't just know something, but their hearts are full of something. It's, they're full of trust in Christ. This is our entire essence. This is what flows through our blood Faith in Jesus Christ, trust in his word, belief that God's promises are true and he will fulfill them. This is a wonderful transformation of our dead, sinful hearts that are alive and holding Christ within them by faith. In fact, in Ephesians 3.17, Paul mentions that it is Christ who dwells in our hearts by faith. When our hearts are full of faith, they are full of Christ, right? Right? Hearts that are full of faith are full of Christ. Now, I want you to note the end phrase of verse 1. We're saints who are faithful in Christ Jesus. These things are true of us because we are in Christ. Because we're in union with Christ. We've been transformed. It's because of the work of Christ and our relationship with him. The fact that we are in him. That we can be called saints and faithful. It's not something inherent to us. We can't do this apart from Christ. We can't be this apart from Christ. We must be in Christ. How vital it is that we be found in Christ. How we need to see that our entire identity is wrapped up in this simple phrase, in Christ. That is who I am. I am a person who is a saint and filled with faith because I am in Christ Jesus. I am joined to him. If I am not in Christ, I have nothing. If I am not in Christ, 
I have nothing. And I will search my whole life long for some identity, some way to define who I am and why I matter in this world. But if I am in Christ, I have everything. And my search for meaning and significance ends because I see that Christ loved me and gave himself up for me. And now I'm in him. I don't need any other identity. I don't need another way to define myself. The color of my skin, the style of my hair, the clothes, my amount of money I have or don't have, where I was born, none of those things matter to me because I have Christ and I'm in him. I recognize that I've become a faithful saint in him. Our redemption is the result of a divine decision that results in a divine transformation that thirdly gives us a divine provision. A divine provision. Who God is, who we are, what we have. But verse two, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. What do we have in Christ? What are our resources? Ephesians might be titled The Christian's Riches. I mean, that might be a title for the book. If, if they were to give ancient letters like this a modern title, The Christian's Riches. What do we have in Christ? This is going to come up again and again throughout the letter. How necessary it is as believers that we recognize what we have in Christ. So many uh, believers live like spiritual beggars because they don't realize the resources they have in Christ. And this verse tells us two things that we have in Christ. The rest of the book will spell out this in greater detail. But it says, first of all, what, one thing that we have in Christ is grace. Grace. Grace speaks to the beginning of our salvation experience in this context. We are saved by grace. Oh, how this message is hated by humanity today and how it always has been. We don't want to be in need of grace. We want to be independent. We want to be self-sufficient. We want to be the masters of our own fate, the, the captains of our own ship. We want to be autonomous beings who can determine our own destiny. We want some system of religion where we can earn our salvation, where our good works will be recognized as meriting us something before God. We don't want to think that we are vile sinners, rebels who deserve God's judgment and eternal punishment in hell. That message is preposterous today. It is repulsive to people today. And it has always been that way. And it will always be that way until Christ returns. But the Bible is absolutely clear about this. If we are saved at all, we are saved by grace alone. Grace is the difference maker. That is why God sent his son to, into the world to die on a cross, not because we could be good enough to save ourselves, but because the only way we could be saved is by grace, by receiving mercy and righteousness from God that we do not deserve and cannot earn. If you're here this morning and you don't know Christ as your Savior and Lord, there is no message for you this morning of do better, be better, become moral, change this or that thing about your life and God will accept you. The only message for you is the message of grace, that you are a sinner who is condemned before a holy God, but God has sent his holy and righteous son to pay the penalty for the sins of the world. And if you will confess your sins and trust in Jesus, you will be saved. Your sins will be forgiven. You'll experience grace. You'll be saved by grace. But the only way to do that, the only way to be saved by grace is to, to recognize that you need grace and that you can't save yourself. This grace is the grace that saves every single believer, this undeserved love and favor that comes to us from God. And as the hymn writer says, it is this grace that safely leads us home. 
This grace sustains us in our walk with Christ. It sustains us in our faith. We're saved by grace, yes, past, but we're being saved by grace now, and we will be saved by grace in the future. When you stand before Jesus, brothers and sisters, to be judged on the last day and to give an account for your life, you are going to enter into eternal life because of grace. You're not going in because Jesus is going to look and say, you know what, you lived a pretty good life. And so you get to go into heaven by grace plus works. No. You were saved by grace. You're being saved by grace. You will be saved by grace. It is grace from start to finish and every place in between. And Paul tells us here that our marvelous provision from God is this matchless grace of our loving Lord. It's his power and his energy and his strength flowing through us by his spirit on account of his grace. And that leads to a second provision that, that Paul prays and that we have for the Ephesians to have and that we have as believers, and that is peace. Peace. This is where grace leads, isn't it? We were enemies of God, but his grace reconciled us to himself through the cross. And now having been justified by faith, we have what? Peace with God, right? Romans 5.1. Peace is the outcome of our justification. We are in fellowship with God, reconciled to God through his son. You know, as believers, we need to recognize our greatest need has been met because we have peace with God. The greatest problem the unbeliever has is, is nothing about himself or his circumstances. The greatest problem the unbeliever has is the wrath of God. There's no greater problem the unbeliever faces than the wrath of God. It's not his lack of happiness. It's not his lack of contentment. It's not his unpleasant circumstances. It's, it's not anything about his job or his relationships or, or anything about his life. The biggest problem the unbeliever has and the problem Jesus came to solve is God is angry with you because of your sin. And all of your other problems mean nothing in light of that. All of your other problems, people in hell would give anything to have than the problem they have, which is the wrath of God that is on them for eternity. And here we see that as believers, we have peace. Peace with God. Our greatest problem has been resolved. God is not angry with us. In fact, God is reconciled to us, and God calls us his children, his beloved children. Uh, Jesus says, I don't call you my servants anymore. I call you my friends. What an amazing provision. The wrath of God that was on us was poured out on Christ, on the cross, so that we might have peace with God. And that peace is to guard our hearts and minds in Christ. That peace is the fruit of the Holy Spirit with whom we are to be constantly filled. We should be a people marked by peace because we have an abundance of peace from God the Father and our Lord Jesus Christ. In a microcosm, our entire salvation that is provided for us in Christ from the Father is in this blessing of grace and peace, beginning to end. All of our salvation, we have this rich resource from God of a fullness of grace that is greater than our sins and the peace that resolves our biggest problem as the resources we have in Christ. Everything that we need. Ephesians begins with these foundational truths. And the rest of the letter is built upon these, that God is the Savior, and we've been saved on account of a divine decision. Uh, Because of that, we've been transformed by his saving work so that we are now faith-filled saints in Christ. And we've been given all that we need as God's people because he abundantly multiplies to us his grace and his peace. What an amazing God we serve. What an amazing salvation God has given to us. I can't wait to begin unpacking the details of this in verse 3. That's just sort of the, the introduction to the riches that we're about to walk into in this, in this treasury, the spiritual treasury of the book of Ephesians. Next week, we'll begin to unpack this as we begin looking at verses 3 through 14. But for this week, it's enough to know who God is, who we are, and what we have. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word, what comfort it brings to those of us who are in Christ, to know that you have put your hand upon us, you have called us out of darkness into light, we are yours because of your will, 
And Lord, we thank you that while we were lost, wandering around the hillside like a lost sheep, you came and found us. While we were lost, like that lost coin that slipped into the cracks of the floor and didn't even know it was lost, you came and you found us and you made us yours. You redeemed us, you transformed us, and you've supplied to us everything we need in this life. We give you praise this morning. And Lord, we pray that your message of grace would impact the hearts of those who are here who perhaps don't know you. There are those who are here who are, who are lost, who are not reconciled to you. Father, I pray they would see their need of grace. I pray they would see the danger that they're in under your judgment, but that they would also see the great provision that you have made of forgiveness in Christ and eternal life through him. And they would go to Christ by faith even this morning. Lord, we lift these things up to you in Jesus' name.